can have everybody's attention. Got it. So uh, I think everybody here knows me, but if not, I'm Randy Olson. Uh, I'm a chair of ophthalmology, and I'm really excited for today. We've got a good showing of people. That's fantastic. Uh, we uh, like everybody here because it's uh, so much great work has gone on to the effort of these talks, but uh, in particular, we're honored to have uh, Ike Ahmed here with us. And uh, I think we've probably got a few of the faces here because of uh, Ike. Uh, so just to give a little idea about Ike, who uh, uh, trained here with Alan in the Glaucoma Fellowship and has gone on to just be a superstar, is that he and I had a chance to be speaking at the ANSI meeting here about 18 months ago. And uh, they have a couple of keynote speakers, and, and he was a keynote, and I was a keynote, and, and I saw Ike off over to the side, and there was just this crowd hanging around Ike. And I'm looking at this, and I'm saying, holy mackerel, this is like a rock star with his groupies going around there. And they were all going on, and I'm trying to go over and say hello to Ike. And Ike being the warm, humble guy, he finally broke out of this group, came over, and gave me a big bear hug, and, and go on. I said, Ike. It's the first time in ophthalmology I feel like I'm in the presence of a rock star. <laughs> so Alan, uh, Alan knows what I'm talking about. Ike always takes it good naturally. But it, it, is, it is amazing uh, how his career has gone on. And he's going to talk about some of the exciting things that represent uh, where you know, he really has been out there on the cutting edge doing some amazing stuff. So we're extremely proud of Ike and I'm very pleased that we can have him here. So we've got an exciting day. We've got some nervous residents that are going to get a chance to give their presentations and uh, we always appreciate that. And I think with that, Bob, I turn it over to you, don't I? Yeah, I think so. Thanks, Randy. Okay, the next two patients are both patients in, from my practice and I'll be presenting the first one and then David Phillips will present the second one. Those of you that have had a chance to, hopefully all of you had a chance to see the patients upstairs. So I'll, I'll go through these quickly so we can save our time for the discussion. <clears throat> An 88-year-old female presented to me with, for a glaucoma evaluation with the main complaint that she just couldn't tolerate any drops at all. Uh, she had had a history of numerous IOP spikes in the past, but really couldn't tolerate anything except for maybe some Brinza. She had a past ocular history of pseudoexfoliation. Uh, she had anatomic narrow angles and received an LPI in both eyes back in 2004. She had FACO in both eyes successfully and, again, had several episodes of very high IOP spikes. Uh, nothing significant on past medical history other than she's just on Simbrinza. That's the only drop that she could really tolerate in the left eye. Um, nothing remarkable on social history or review of systems, or, but her left eye was not correctable to 2020 blurry vision. On presentation, 2040 vision in the right, 2200. And particularly of note here is that she had well-controlled IOPs when I first saw her of 14 in both eyes. Normal corneal thickness, actually thicker corneas than average. And her gonia was quite narrow, particularly in the right eye. I had a very difficult time seeing any trabecular mesh work, although she appeared to be fairly deep uh, centrally. In the left eye, with indentation, I could see maybe just a little strip of the TM there uh, with some mild pigmentation. Uh, the remainder of her exam was notable for patent PIs in both eyes, pseudophagy in both eyes, and she had really minimal cupping. OCT was normal, both eyes, everything was in the normal range, and her visual field showed some very minimal scattered changes in both eyes, but relatively preserved visual field. So this is her clinical course, and just to draw your attention to the IOP, um, the, right, the left eye spiked in April of last year, and then earlier this year in February, the right eye spiked. And we've been unable to control her with anything other than Simbrinza. SLT wasn't an option, nor could she tolerate any other drops that we had available. So this is her clinical course. She had an anterior vitrectomy, goniosyniculysis, and a gap procedure in the left eye. And what I noted during surgery was by the time I made my first incision with the paracentesis, there was constant posterior pressure. It was very difficult to maintain the chamber. So the anterior vitrectomy in the left eye was actually unplanned. I went ahead and did an anterior vitrectomy, a dry vitrectomy through pars plana, just to get enough chamber deepening, and then I proceeded with the goniosyniculysis and GAP procedure. In March of this year, she underwent the same thing, but because I knew what had happened in the left eye, I went ahead and did a vitrectomy right from the beginning, and she underwent the same procedure, goniosyniculysis and a GAP procedure. Her current pressures are 19 in the right eye and 12 in the left eye, and she's currently on no drops. But what I'm noticing on clinical exam, and those of you that had a chance to see her, is that her AC continues to shallow, and the angles are getting more and more narrow. And 
the dilemma I have is, do I need to do anything preemptively before she completely zips up her angles? So now I'm going to just show you some Pentacam photos. Um, I didn't have any other ability to image her angles because I saw her primarily in the community clinics. Uh, but this is a Pentacam from the right eye in February. It looks remarkably, you know, shallow. But you'll see in, com in contrast to the most recent Pentacam photos how she's much more shallow. This was the left eye in February, quite deeper. This is the eye that had the first uh, GAT procedure in goniosynechiolysis. And then again, now in May, we're closer to this time, we can see that the right eye is really significantly shallowing and the left eye as well. And then this is just kind of a montage. The top photos are the earlier Pentacam photos from um, February, and now we can see in May on the bottom half are the two Pentacam photos showing the significantly shallow anterior chambers in both eyes. So for discussion, some of the things that I wanted to bring up today were why is her AC shallowing? Why does it continue to shallow despite uh, the procedures that she's had? And why is this patient's IOP relatively well controlled despite what appears to be progressively narrowing angles? And is there such a thing as benign malignant glaucoma? This is a, you know, oxymoron, but something for discussion. So I can bring you up. Well, thanks, Craig. This is, um, I think you summarized it very well, and I think, uh, as, as I think you've indicated already, I think this is really uh, a picture of malignant glaucoma. Um, she seems to have susceptibility, she seems to have a pre existing history of angle closure and narrow angles. I don't know what her biometry was or axial length. Did we? we kind of that up okay, I'm, yeah. I'm guessing she's talking to her. When I talked to her, she says she was into bifocals and she was 30. So likely she's a you know, hyper rope, short eye. Uh, Postoperatively, she's been myopic. She's been able to see without glasses, so you know her eye was likely sitting forward, as you indicated there. Um, you know, I think that right right now, as as we sit here and examine her here, she she is zipped up. She's got PAS pretty well all the way around. Uh, she's got a shallowing chamber, and this is consistent with malignant glaucoma. Um, you know, the treatment for malignant glaucoma, you know, in our experience and many others, is to create a unicameral eye. It's not to do vitrectomy, uh, but it's to create a unicameral eye, which can be done anteriorly, can be done by laser basically by making a larger adectomy, lasering through the zonules in the capsular bag, and then uh, trying to hit the anterior hyoid, and having immediate deepening of the, of the chamber, as well as surgical, which can be done with a cutter anteriorly or through the pars plana. And that would be the definitive treatment. Now, whether this patient needs it or not is another question. If we did do it for this patient, though, that wouldn't be enough, because this patient now has, of course, 360 degrees PAS. So at the same time of doing that, uh, irritable zonulo hyalidectomy, as one would call it, it would be important to do a gonosynechiolysis at the same time, intraoperative gonioscopy, releasing the synechia, and, uh, and allowing for free access of aqueous. You know, her pressure is it's, it's quite interesting with angle closure. We see patients who have what appears to be 360 degrees appositional or even synechial closure, sometimes with normal pressures. And, and why is that? Well, this patient is 88. This patient is not secreting as the normal patient would, or sorry, I shouldn't say normal, a younger patient would. Um, there is, of course, the uh, uvicular outflow mechanism pathway that still uh, is, is still typically uh, intact, even though the celery body space is not visible. And those may be some of the reasons. There's probably some, some of her angle is still functional in, in important areas that may be still accounting for her IOP to be controlled, although she's pretty labile, it sounds like, and that, that's probably one reason for that as well. Um, I don't think there's anything, anything as benign. I think it's controlled malignant, malignant glaucoma. Um, she has not been a cycloplegics, has she? Okay, so, you know, that's, that's one thing that may be considered. I mean, I know she doesn't tolerate aqueous suppression, but that's typically you know, the combination of treatment, but one can do that. We find it's very hard to get people off cycloplegics. Uh, although the surgical treatment does, may, may appear to be aggressive, uh, you know, I, I think it's generally well tolerated, um, done in a controlled fashion. Um, you know, the challenge for her, she's 88, her pressures are relatively okay on her current IOP. She says she's seeing okay, although she's dependent on her glasses for, for, for things that she's used to, and her fields are normal, you know. And that's, I think, probably the conundrum that we find ourselves in. But invariably, um, you know, it's, and it's hard to know life expectancy here, I think she's going to get continual problems. And eventually her IP will get further out of control. Her disease, disease will be harder to treat now with her chamber shallowing even further and, and her nerve is more at risk. She's also potentially at risk for vascular events as well if her IOP, you know, shoots up. And so I, I think I would have a good conversation with her about the next step, which I think would be to do a combined iridozonular hyalidectomy uh, using a surgical approach uh, and a gonosecolysis. And why surgical? Because laser is not going to resolve the PAS and may in fact tip her over as far as worsening of her problem. That's, that's what I would say my immediate uh, point would be. We published uh, uh, about four, three or four years ago a series of about 25 patients after routine FACO, after routine FACO that developed malignant glaucoma. And for the residents in the room, 
Please read in, uh, the uh, Harry Quigley Jackson Memorial Lecture, Academy Lecture, about maybe seven, eight years ago. And the reason why we don't call this aqueous misdirection, because that's a misnomer. Malignant glaucoma is the, is the, is the correct term, which is a constellation of choroidal expansion, uh, loss of vitreous conductivity due to compression forces from the choroid, and an eye that's susceptible, meaning a small lens iris channel because of the small nature of the middle segment in these small eyes. Um, but I think that's, uh, that, that's I think, what, what would need to be done here. And, uh, and again, interesting, in our case series, every single one of the 25 patients were all female. And there's a lot of discussion about angle closure and, 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 and gender and choroidal uh, you know, uh, vascular, vascular permeability. We also, we're also going to publish a series of patients that uh, we found there's a seasonal variation as well as far as the presentation of malignant glaucoma. It's a lot we don't quite understand with this, but certainly in this, in this patient here, I think, um, you know, if this patient was a lot younger, for me, it'd be hands down, get in there. At this point, I can see the argument to maybe treat her cycloplegia, see how she does maybe, watch her IPs for a while, but I think she's going to run into trouble as we go along here. That, that'd be my thoughts. I don't know what the rest of the group thinks, but very interesting case. So, so I, what, why do you think there's such a female component? What's the, what's the, the, the reasoning? Well, I mean, you know, there's a lot of this, well, I mean, you know, historically, of course, there's been obviously discussion about uh, gender and, uh, and, va and vascular permeability, immuno immunological differences as well between genders as well. Um, I think that the, those things play a role. It doesn't seem to be a, a, a biometric reason uh, between male and female eyes, you know. Um, you, know uh, you know, some of these patients are younger, you know, as well, hormonal, you know, differences as well. So. Another difference that I don't quite uh, fully, I think, appreciate or understand yet. So, but that's something, and we know angle closure is, is more common in females and it seems to carry over with, with malignant glaucoma. So post-FACO, anybody post-FACO, and even an eye that's, uh, one, a couple of the pearls I will mention, malignant glaucoma is not, doesn't always present with a pressure of 50 with a flat AC. You can have subtle malignant glaucoma, the angles can be still relatively open, slightly narrow, with a pressure that's slightly elevated or even normal, but a lens eye diaphragm that's moved forward. Uh, anybody who ends up being myopic after surgery, especially in a small eye, it's got to be the number one differential. Is there actual displacement of the lens, ruling out capsule block syndrome and other issues as well. So I think that's an, that's an important concept. And malignant glaucoma after FACO is not necessarily uncommon, especially in susceptible eyes. So uh, I can tell you there's a lot of people floating around here like this. I'm, I'm managing a case like this that's a, about a 60-year-old patient and has been going on for a long time. Very hard to treat now because of the synechia and the elevated pressure. Um, so it's, uh, it's a great case to present. So, Thanks for, thanks for sharing that. Hopefully, it's a good discussion. A, in your series, were there a lot of patients with 2 X? I mean, is this, how do you? Yeah, so 2 is a good question. When I, when I first heard the story, I thought maybe, does she have loose zonules? So that's a good question about differential. Does she have loose zonules? Is the eye well pushed forward actually because of loose zonules? We've seen that, of course, happen. Uh, is this patient, does the patient have a large Sommerings ring? Uh, rarely that can happen. We can see a big Sommerings push everything forward and cause progressive angle closure with, uh, with, with Sommerings proliferation. She had surgery recently, though, in March, so, you know, I think it was recently, right? So, uh, and I saw a bit of Sommerings through the aerodectomy, but it doesn't seem to be, doesn't to be large. Um, in our series, we didn't have enough to really look at and see whether there was a correlation between that. You know, I think that, um, I don't know if that's the primary issue with her. Prior to surgery, of course, as, as we all know, so exfoliation can often uh, convert to angle closure, so, and typically because of, again, the lens shifting forward. So going to also be very important uh, please, please, please do gonio all, as much as you can because I know it's a bit of a lost art and for the residents in the room, you know, carry that gonio lens in your pocket just like you carry a, a, a 90 and a, and a 20. So it's, uh, it's an important tool in our armamentarium. Thank you. Thank you. Morning, everybody. I'm David Phillips. I'm one of the Glaucoma Fellows. I've got another case here to present. She was here earlier for everybody to kind of get a view of. So initially she was referred uh, for a poor vision following YAG late in 2015. It was seen by our cornea service with a uh, pressure of 43 in early 2016. She was initially referred uh, for decreased vision in that right eye to the cornea service and uh, it was she was promptly referred to Dr. Chai after starting Comigan and Latanoprost. The vision did improve after starting that, so the vision was kind of just a steamy cornea uh, from an elevated pressure. Past ocular history includes a macular hole in the kind of an eye of non-interest today uh, with vitrectomy for that and subsequent uh, cataract surgery OU by an outside provider and then a, um, a YAG 
in both eyes, the right eye having kind of a bout of inflammation treated with Durazol and subsequent kind of pressure issues and uh, non-improved vision. Past medical history, uh, COPD requiring O2, um, history of GERD, pulmonary nodule in 2013 on CT that resolved by 2014. Uh, social history, kind of an ominous sign when the glaucoma specialist is going through all of this, but um, really nothing of interest except being a former smoker. Uh, positive change kind of, of it, this is kind of retrospectively going back it's since about 2014, 2015. Uh, of eye color change in the right eye, but everything else was um, kind of non-significant. Uh, initial exam with Dr. Chaya, um, you know, demonstrated 2020, a little eccentric in the left, probably from that previous macular hole. Pressures were controlled. Uh, gonio was performed a little deeper on the right. Uh, no uh, NBA or NBI was noted. Pup some pupil irregularity on the right was noted prior to dilation. Um, I talked with Dr. Chaya about her, she just had kind of these multiple iris nevi that were, you know, fairly insignificant in nature at that time. Um, and this would have been the initial exam in early 2016, uh, PCIOL with um, an open capsule. Um, so the IOP was doing great, thought we'd leave her on Lutanoprost, um, stop the comb again, and uh, see her back in four weeks and just kind of stage her with a field. That was her initial field. Um, so we, we, got that, we got that field, and after stopping the comb again, her pressure bumped up. We restarted the comb again, and pressure came down. We wanted to repeat that field since that was her first field she ever taken, just to kind of confirm, confirm things. Follow-up visit, uh, the field was confirmed to be um, that severe, which I'll demonstrate here in just a second. IOP was 17. Uh, we, you know, on closer gonio now, um, thought there was a fine vessel superior, some kind of uh, trace fine pigmented cell in that right eye, some lacy iris, uh, you know, NV, mild heterochromia with the unaffected blue iris uh, being lighter than the, uh, you know, involved right irity. Um, there's that field which just basically confirmed, we've already kind of discussed this, so I'll save discussion for the end. So kind of putting it all together, we thought, you know, unilateral advanced glaucoma in the setting of heterochromia, lacy NVI, and uh, mild inflammation, you know, with a retrospective scope, you would, um, you know, and thus the presumptive diagnosis of Fuchs heterochromic <coughs> urticyclitis. Looking back, you know, the, uh, there was probably a lack of the typical uh, cryptless iris that you normally see with Fuchs, um, and Fuchs typically presents at a slightly younger age. Um, so, you know, hindsight being 2020, you know, it might be a knock against that. But um, continue the present drop regimen and follow closely at this time, you know, since her pressure was responsive. Um, vision remained good, pressure remained down at the visit in August. Then November, she spiked up to 23. Discussed risk benefits of a trabeculectomy with mitomycin. Decision was made to proceed, working on the presumptive diagnosis of Fuchs. Um, operation in early uh, January, which I participated in, really uneventful except for some mild uh, bleeding upon entry of the AC with the uh, diamond keratome, which resol resolved on its own. We kind of attributed this to, you know, the, the uh, not uncommon lacy vessel leakage that you can see when decompressing an AC in Fuchs. Um, did well post-operatively, uh, as you can see there, had to cut one suture. Um, and then at that point, um, you know, these nevi, you know, started to kind of just morph and become enlarged and kind of develop prominent in, uh, neo over the nevi themselves. And that prompted referral with UBM to uh, Dr. Shakur and Dr. Uh, Dr. Harry. And uh, we're very fortunate here to have Dr. Harry. It's not the tool, it's the craftsman. He's an amazing craftsman as far as giving us amazing images on ultrasound, so it's a true blessing. But again, you can see these lesions, um, and I'll go through, th these are the, the photos that uh, Shakur obtained, or that we obtained prior to sending to Sh Dr. Shakur. Uh, to quote the, I guess, late Jim Comey, these are mildly nauseating. Um, <laughs> Gonio photos here, obviously very concerning. 
um, kind of multi-nodularity, some crippless features here with high PAS. Um, so we, I'll cut to the chase and then we'll get to the discussion. So at this point, you know, it's um, looking back, you know, Fuchs was our working diagnosis, but at this point, iris melanoma has galloped to the front of the list versus a metastasis. Dr. Shakur and Dr. Harry kind of got together and they thought these masses were pretty solid and robust. So they were, you know, with it, her previous history of a pulmonary nodule, previous smoking history that a met uh, was probably their leading thought. Um, and he thought that the chronic anterior uveitis and secondary glaucoma were all secondary to the above. Plan was oncology referral here at the U, uh, based, some baseline labs to rule out any kind of inflammatory process, basically a pan scan with a scan of the brain as well, all to um, basically make sure this wasn't a MET. If it's not a MET, then let's get, a, let's get some tissue. Um, and all that turned up negative. We did get some tissue with a AC biopsy, iris biopsy, and vitreous biopsy with iris repair, uh, as you could see um, you know, on exam today. Uh, the Dr. Mamlis, you know, basically confirmed the diagnosis of a spindle cell melanoma, the iris and ciliary body being involved. Vitreous cytology, although had paucity of cells, did demonstrate the presence of two malignant cells. Um, we discussed with Dr. Park, discussed with uh, our, our uh, uveitis fellow, discussed with uh, Dr. Shields, um, and we also sought the opinion of uh, Dr. Winward here locally, but, um, you know, we, and we've kind of discussed that, but at this point, you know, further management thoughts, you know, uh, kind of where to go from here and get your input. Yeah, yeah, give us an easy solution for this. Well, it's a tough case, and I think it's, again, it, it, this is the purpose of having these rounds, right, to be able to uh, learn uh, from our experiences. I think, um, you know, the retrospect, of course, is obviously easy to look back and say, you know, this is probably what happened. The differential, of course, in the patient, she's, how old was she again? She's 60-something? 68. 68. So, I mean, you know, she, she is certainly a little old to, you know, to present a, as a Fuchs. Uh, you know, ice syndrome would be in the list of differential, of course, as well. You know, an enter segment is genesis again, but, you know, it really doesn't fit the profile. Um, and, uh, and so I think, you know, re retrospectively, of course, uh, I think melanoma is, you know, higher up on the list. I, I had, I've had to do a number of these cases over the, over the years, um, managed differently. I guess, I guess fast, fast forwarding, of course, and, you know, the, the challenge, of course, is we've got a TRAB now and a patient who's got, uh, you know, melanoma, which is something, something we typically try to avoid. Um, so, yeah, it poses a lot, poses lots of challenge. What to do with the TRAB and then what to do for her, uh, her primary uh, lesion issue. And she's 20, 25 right now. She's pretty happy with her vision. Um, talking to her, I mean, this is kind of an acquired uh, issue. She, she says she's had baby blue eyes for many, many years and uh, recently has developed these changes, so it certainly fits in with the time course with melanoma. Um, and, she, and I asked her, did she have previous eye care providers following up? You know, someone been seeing her. Did, did anyone comment about anevis or spots on her iris? And she wasn't sure, but that would be interesting to kind of look at that as well. Um, you know, putting aside the TRAB issue, um, we've had good success doing uh, either a partial or a total iridectomy uh, with plaque therapy if there's ciliary body involvement, which of, often, often there is some. And, uh, and you know, with our, with our service um, in Toronto, we've, we've had some good success with that. We often will combine this with a prosthesis uh, later on. She's got an intact capsular bag. Uh, she has had a YAG though, unfortunately, so that makes it hard to use the bag, but that's something that one could consider. Um, you know, nucleation obviously has got to be up on the list in, the, in these scenarios, um, and I'd be curious what the oncology folks feel. Uh, and by the way, just to put a plug in, we just, just, just check out the re recent survey. Carol Shields and I just published a review on uh, surgical management and radio management uh, of uh, iris melanoma, reviews of protein, be protein bomb, uh, beam therapy, uh, radio plaque therapy, and, and surgical therapy. Um, but the, the trap part does, 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 does concern me as far as the risk uh, of, uh, of, uh, of dissemination. Um, I think that, uh, I, in my mind, I think about a shutdown of the TRAB with, an ir, ir, with a ir, to complete iridectomy and a plaque, but I think, I think that, uh, I don't know, I think she's kind of, you know, on the edge of thinking about nucleation here, unfortunately. You know, I think just with, just with, the, uh, with the positive findings and the, and the TRAB, um, you know, I, I, in these cases, I, I do defer to my oncology colleagues. Uh, I'm happy to deal with it surgically, but from the oncology side, I, I would defer to uh, the experts in the area. Yeah. Tough case. Yeah. Like what's, the, what's the outcome with 
doing a complete hearinectomy and plaque therapy, and what, is she going to have reasonable vision? <coughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. She, I expect her to have very good vision, maybe some CME, CME risk. Uh, of course, the, uh, the visual functional things and the, and the, um, and the, uh, you know, the photophobia and other issues are, are, are going to be potentially present, although that is variable. But, uh, you know, we'll, 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 we'll put together our series at some point. We've got about maybe six, page, seven patients like this. Most of them I have had, though, have been a partial iridectomy, uh, for example, or just only plaque therapy, you know. But this is a total iris, and I don't know. I think that's going to be, uh, you know, a question. So, Alan and I have Certainly over the years, you have done a fair number of these. Uh, and, and I always felt, though, that uh, once it's into the angle, and it looks to me like this is into the angle. Mm -hmm. The UBM showed that uh, yeah. it's going body involvement, yeah. Well, you've got it, got it in the angle, obviously, your ejectomy is going to get that part. And, and, and if it's 360, is, is, is that possible for a plaque? So, so that's, that's the question, is what, to what extent is it? Yeah, exactly. If it's 360, if it's like... localized, then I don't know if you can do that. And, and I don't know, we, we, we've had a couple of cases we've shared in which we've done and had a good yeah, result. Yeah, I think that you're absolutely right, Randy. I mean, but I think when it's 360, if, if, it's, if it's 360, and I, and I don't know what I don't I don't know what the UBM showed. I, I got the There's impression. There was one or two clock hours involved in the ciliary body, so it was diffuse iris melanoma, but the ciliary. Yeah, body. that's my impression was. Well, so, that's, that's so, 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 so you could, so you could, you could plaque that, and then and deal with the iris. So that, that's one. You know, you're absolutely right, there, Randy. If it's like a ring melanoma yeah. or complete 360, then 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 you're not going to be able to get success with that. You know. And by the way, the pl plaque therapy often helps with, uh, with IOP reduction as well, we found, you know, when the pressures are up. Or we do, you know, we typically treat cyclodiode with these, right? If the pressures are up before, before uh, plaque therapy, we'll cyclodiode these patients if we need to before, before the surgery, before they're plaqued. Um, but I still, I still wonder, though, whether this patient needs to have their nucleation. I still wonder about that here, you know. She's, she's, got, she's, got, a, she's got a parent that has a father died from pancreatic cancer. Her mother has breast cancer with METs. Uh, she's a smoker as well. She's got some risk factors, all that history part, you know. Talk about history, guys. History is so important, right, with all these things. Do you think a nucleation is going to get cells that spread through the trap, or are you talking exoneration? Oh, I think exoneration might be a bit much here, I think, uh, you know. But, but, but I, do, I, do, I do worry. I do worry, but I think, I think that I wouldn't, I think that's a pretty big step to go forward it's to, you know. It's a big step, on yeah. the other hand. Once it spreads, it's a bad situation. Yeah, it is, it is, it is, it is. It's, uh, it's a hard one to, to grapple with. I, I, I don't know if... I don't know if I go so far as saying as generation for a theoretical concern. It'd be a bit, be very aggressive, and uh, even I'm even wonder, I'm wondering whether nucleation could be, you know, I'm I'm wavering between that. But again, I would I would defer my to my oncology experts to maybe give a advice on that. Nucleation with, with carefully taking all of that anterior conjunctival. I don't know. Yeah. So in the old days, we distinguished between nucleation and exaggeration. Nowadays, we have we do this a lot with uh, melanoma, so I'm trying to preserve as much tissue as possible, so we do a nucleation, nucleation plus, which is, as you say, we can preserve the conjunctival and anterior orbit, and then there is a medium and an advanced exaggeration, which is a complete, I think a total exaggeration would be overkill here for sure. Um, but we also do frozen sections during mm -hmm. nucleation, so we can take samples from the conjunctiva, nucleate the eyeball, but then now we have to that, and if the cells are okay, we preserve the right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, once the decision is made, Well, and, 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 I, and I'm wondering whether that would be an interesting thought to do, do a biopsy there. I'm not aware of any case reports, though, I don't, and it's hard to prove, I guess, of a, of a trap done uh, with, syst with the systemic uh, dissemination and, and linked back to the trap. I'm not aware of that, but it's theoretical. Secondly, when we think about aqueous flow through a trap, right, you know, where does aqueous flow? Well, it, of course, it flows through the conjunctiva, it flows through the, you know, microcyst, through the tear film, it flows through lymphatics, right, lymphatics are important, and it flows through the uh, episcleral veins aqueous veins. So, you know, I think, uh, I think probably, you know, timely management here is going to be important to try to address this soon. But, um, you know, I think, I, I think even doing a nucleation, there's still going to be long-term long -term risks here in this right. patient. So, yeah. Thanks for sharing, guys. <laughs>